Okay, it's Dr. Lauren Lounen from Keene State College, and this is the last segment of a lecture series called Making Sense of Genomic Data, Gene Calling, and Genome Annotation. It's really an introduction to this topic. So what we're going to do in this segment is search for open reading frames as the first step in searching for a gene in a sequence or a genome. Or more specifically, we're going to talk about what an open reading frame is and some of the concepts around that. We just finished talking about reading frames. So now let's take it forward into the idea of ORFs or open reading frame. So an open reading frame is a stretch of DNA sequence that starts with a start codon. Most start codons are ATG and end with a stop codon. And there are three common stop codons, TAG, TAA, and TGA. And there, it's important that, there, that you know that there can be no interrupting or internal stop codon. So you can't have a stop codon in the middle of an open reading frame. An open reading frame is an hypothesized gene. So it's a sequence that might represent a gene, but it also might not represent a gene. So the, if you think about the fact that there are only four nucleotides in DNA, the likelihood of just getting a random sequence was actually pretty high for any given you know, area that you might be looking at. So there are, in fact, many more ORFs in a genome than actual genes even though it is true that each actual gene must contain an ORF. So we look for ORFs bioinformatically. It's a, it gives us a search image. They can be, as I said, they can occur by chance alone. So once we identify them, we have to use additional information to call the gene, i.e., is it or isn't it a, a likely gene or a real gene? So the information that we use once we've found an ORF is to look for what are called basal signals, for example, promoter sequences, which are always associated with genes. Look for splicing sites, that's true in uh, eukaryotic genes only. Look for ribosome binding sequences, which are always found in the 5' un, um, untranslated region of gene sequences. We can look for regulatory sequences, which tend to be pretty organism specific. We can look for um, codon usage. We can collect basic statistics on that and see if the codon usage patterns fit what would be expected for the kind of organism that we're studying. We also look at the length of the open reading frame. So if it's smaller than 300 base pairs, that tends to be a bit suspect because most genes tend to be longer than 300 base pairs um, in either prokaryotes or eukaryotes. And we can also do what's called homology seek, uh, searching. So we can look to see if our ORF matches other known gene sequences in the databases that exist that we have access to. And we'll talk more about these concepts a little bit more in this lecture and more also in other areas of the course, especially the homology um, searching aspect. So there are computer-based gene finding methods to look for ORFs. And these are primarily, these only actually apply to protein coding genes, so I'm not going to talk today about non-protein coding genes, like the ones that encode functional RNA. So if you are looking for protein coding genes in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, you look at the sequence. And when you look at the sequence, the first thing you look for are ORFs. And once you've found the ORFs, you look for these other aspects to see if the ORF really is a gene, or really is likely to be a gene. So again, there are more ORFs in a genome than actual genes, and so you need to look for ORFs and then include additional information in order to test the hypothesis that the ORF is a gene. So some of the additional information that you look for is what's called codon usage, and this is a table. The source of the table is here. This is a table that shows codon usage in E. coli, or Escherichia coli, a very well-studied bacterium genes. And so here are the different codons that exist. And we can focus just on the ratio number. And so a ratio of 0.57 means that about 57% of the time, the amino acid cysteine is encoded by the codon UGC. And 43% of the time, it's encoded by the codon UGU. So there's a bias towards UGC rather than UGU whenever E. coli wants to utilize cysteine. So that's a codon usage pattern that is typical for this particular organism. So if you were studying a new version of E. coli and you found more cysteine encoded by UGU 
in an open reading frame, you might suspect that that open reading frame wasn't actually true, wasn't accurate, and you would look for additional information because you would be more likely to believe that it was a real a real gene. The open reading frame represented a real gene if it was a if cysteine was encoded about 57% of the time by UGC instead of UGU. Similarly, there can be alternative start codons in certain bacterial strains. They're not all AUG. Um, and there can be other um, codon usage um, patterns that are representative or typical for certain strains. So we can correct, so we can collect statistics on codon usage within ORFs, compare them with what is known in a given species or genome, and then use that information to help us assess whether or not the ORF that we're seeing is an actual gene. What else can we look at? We can look at homology um, information. So how similar is the sequence within the open reading frame, which here we're calling the query sequence, to another one that's already been studied, which is the subject sequence. So this is what is called a DNA alignment. So here's a query sequence, and it's running here, and it's continuing here, and it's continuing here, and so on down. And it is matching in the NCBI GenBank database to this subject, which is and, it is, and these lines show where it perfectly matches, and it looks like a pretty perfect match all the way through. So whatever this query is, is it's perfectly matching to subject 2507. Um, and so that tells us that whatever that subject is, our query is likely identical or the same. It's a homologue of those two things. So looking up here, it's, it's a mouse uh, protein that's acting as a ligand or a receptor protein, and there's messenger RNA data about it. And so if I was searching that query sequence and I got that out of an E. coli, I would suspect that something was wrong because I shouldn't find a mouse gene in E. coli. However, if my target organism, the one I was studying, was a mouse, then I would expect that, you know, that's pretty good data, and it means that I've found an actual real gene. So in eukaryotic systems, um, there's, there are exons, as I talked, as I discussed with earlier in an earlier part of this lecture series. And so each exon will have a particular sequence that we can obtain in, the, in a form called an expressed sequence tag. And the way to get an expressed sequence tag is to actually go into the organism that you're studying, extract all the messenger RNA under whatever conditions you're interested in, take that RNA and do an experiment called reverse transcription where you take the RNA and you turn it into DNA. We call that DNA cDNA for complementary DNA. So it's, it's an artificial construct that we're making in the lab. Once we've got one strand of cDNA, we can build up the other, or the complementary, and we can get a full double-stranded molecule, and then we can sequence it. And that sequenced information is called expressed sequence tags. And when we have all that information, we can essentially do a homology search against DNA data, and we can see where the expressed sequence tags line up, and then we can prove that we have a gene, and we can, we can prove that these sequences are exon sequences. And so that's a, a system or a set of uh, experimental process that we can use in eukaryotic systems. So this is sort of elaborating on that a little bit more. So here's an actual DNA sequence, and this has got the full structure of a gene laid out on it. How do you get the full structure of a gene? Well, you do DNA sequencing and you do similarity searches using BLAST, which is like homology searches against the NCBI GenBank database. You look at codon bias, which I talked about a minute ago, and you look at the sequences of expressed sequence tags, and you see how they align with the total DNA sequence that you've achieved. And from that, you and, and using your knowledge of gene structure in eukaryotes, you build up and label an entire gene and see if it's something that makes sense. You know, it doesn't make sense that that gene would occur in that particular organism. So we're going to focus, as I said earlier, on prokaryotic genes in this course. And we're going to be using a program called PROCA out at, in the future in this course. And we'll be using this to annotate assembled prokaryotic genomic DNA sequence. And when we run PROCA, 
it's going to in turn draw on a set of algorithms or a set of informatic tools that are going to do gene calling. And these are the tools that PROCA uses. So I won't get into the details of those tools. We'll be looking at those a little bit more later in the course, and we'll be actually using PROCA to find genes and to identify them in prokaryotic systems. So in closing, I want you to remember that genes Identifying genes informatically is only part of the process of genome annotation. So you take your genome sequence and you do what is called statistical gene prediction or co use computational methods. You look for open reading frames and you do homology searches and you try to figure out if it's likely that, that, that those particular open reading frames actually are genes. Then you take that information and you do a set of additional experiments both in the computer and also you can do um, out of the computer wet lab experiments which aren't shown there and using all of those different algorithms and tools you can better analyze the open reading frames to determine if they truly are genes and to even predict gene functions if they're novel ORFs that you're not finding in the the broader uh, genomic and non-genomic data sets that exist you apply biological knowledge um, that you've got through expertise and through the literature and you use comparative genomic tools to figure out and answer the question, is this open reading frame really a gene? What is that gene? You know, what is it like in other organisms? And how can I label it and understand it in the organism that I'm studying? And so with that, I will conclude this uh, set of mini lectures pertaining to the topic of genome annotation and gene calling. And you will do um, an activity where you actually look for open reading frames in some DNA sequence next.